Good morning. Good morning, Lincoln students. A year ago, we began our guest speaker series as part of a storytelling movement to foster the entrepreneurial mindset at Lincoln, to inspire risk-taking and learn about global issues and empathy through the voice of individuals that told their stories. Among our guests, we had Lincoln parent Rodolfo Carvajal, a teacher who lived the fall of the Berlin Wall at age 12, a journalist that survived Baghdad bombings, and a, board, and a board member who spoke about educating for uncertainty. Today, I have the honor of introducing a dear friend and member of the Lincoln family, class of 1992, Álvaro Cedeño Molinari. Álvaro has a vocation of public service. He believes in making the collective pie larger before cutting himself a slice. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the need to help as many people as he can, especially among the 80% most vulnerable Can you hear me? Okay. Do I have to start all over again? Okay. He collaborates with Cambiatus, a blockchain based platform that is launching a social currency to help people buy more essential goods in times of crisis. He also founded a technology company on the fourth industrial revolution and is in the process of launching an online plat learning platform focused on transformational leadership. He is a lawyer by profession with two master degrees in peace and conflict transformation and public policy and management. He served for 12 years as a government official, diplomat and ambassador for the Costa Rican government and served in China, Japan and the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Alvaro returned to Costa Rica in the late 2019 and is married to his Brazilian wife, whom he met during volunteer work in India. They have two daughters, ages seven and three. Please, let's welcome Alvaro. <laughs> We're going to unmute Alvaro. Okay, thank you. Yeah, otherwise it would have been a rather boring presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Katya, for that kind introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, in fact, we were scheduled to do this on March 18th, but the quarantine in Costa Rica started two days before, so we couldn't have that talk then. Um, in a way, I'm, I'm happy we're doing it today because I am in Nosara, Guanacaste, enjoying beautiful weather and uh, taking some time to have a conversation with uh, our fellow Lincoln family. Uh, I am going to jump right in and I'm going to share my, my screen. So if you could please give me access to sharing. Katia, I think you're the, you're the host. Okay, now I can. Great. So, here we go. Um, I want to speak today about bio-leadership, which is the kind of leadership that the planet needs. Uh, it might not necessarily be the leadership you're used to exercising, but it is important and to understand, at least from my point of view, that every one of us has his or her own leadership style. So adding a, a bioliteracy to your leadership style could allow you to perform in multiple ways in which the planet needs 
you, especially your generation, to perform. Um, to start with a prelude, I want to say a few things. Number one is that this conversation is an invitation for you to connect different dots that you feel might relate to things you're interested in or that allow you to discover new things that maybe you had not heard much about. So I invite you to please connect the dots. In the end, this invitation for the next 30 minutes also applies for the next 30 years and beyond because each one of us draws our own individual unique picture. Um, second, as a prelude, I want to tell you that the year 2050 sounds very far away right now, but I can assure you for certain that it will arrive. And the best proof of it is that 30 years ago, in 1990, I was a very active, joyful uh, Lincoln School student and um, engaged in multiple activities, very interested in learning, uh, building a lot of friendships that last until today, like Katya here, and I also saw Astrid on, on the chat. So 2050 is going to arrive. That's for certain. So what you do between now and then could be part of your legacy. Speaking of legacy, I also want to invite you to leave your footprint during this conversation. So every, every time I finish one of these colorful topics, I'm going to ask a question so that you can interact through our chat. The idea of this is that we can together co-create a set of questions that would allow us to develop collective interests that could allow us to move forward in multiple directions that may be new to us today. Um, so I know that attention span has been significantly reduced because of technology, especially in times of going to school on Zoom. I, I really cannot relate because I never had the experience. But if I could share with you only one thing for you to take away from this bio leadership conversation is this, and let me show it to you in a bigger format, okay? So the way we understand this model of regenerative development is we have a world economy that you see here in blue, and the world economy is all the interchange of goods and services that happens among human beings, okay? The world economy only takes place wherever there are viable human communities. And by viable, I don't simply mean people are there. I mean people have the possibility of engaging in the interchange of goods and services. Uh, there are countries in the world that are uh, engaged in civil war or that have uh, a fairly destroyed economic system or that have been ravaged by a, a climate disaster, it's difficult to think about economy taking place in that kind of context. You would never find an international investment fund saying, yes, I am going to put money in a country that has been in a civil war for 10 years, for example. So you have the global economy, you have the global civilization of human beings, and the global civilization of human beings only exists within a resilient and robust ecosystem that we refer to as the biosphere. The biosphere is this very thin membrane of planet Earth where all living beings coexist and live. If you dig a hole 10 kilometers deep in the ground, you won't find life. If you go 10 kilometers up in the air, you won't find life. You only find life here where we are living with all other forms of life. And this model is very important to keep in mind because we have two accelerations that are closing in very fast. One of them is climate change. It has been happening, well, for 200 years approximately. We've known for certain with science that it has been happening for about 50. We've been trying to figure out ways to move forward through international politics, more or less for about 40. And now we have come to a turning point where the window of opportunity of about 10 years is critical to determine 
what the future of life on Earth will be. Uh, I, I know this sounds a little bit too dramatic. I don't want it to be because it also represents opportunities for new leaders to take on new directions and new projects to move forward. And the second acceleration is the fourth industrial revolution, which is the, the economic model in which data, computing data, is the new currency. So everything that generates data has the potential of being monetized. And these two accelerations are growing really fast and putting a lot of pressure on the biosphere. So the biosphere is top priority. Without it, there is no other form of life. Then human civilizations are the ones that articulate the global economy. And then finally, the global economy should be reshaped in a way that its impact is positive on both civilization and the biosphere. So if you can walk away with one thing today, I would say is this little image here. Apologies for my terrible digital drawing skills. Okay, so moving on. Um, I don't know if everything is clear so far. If you can just type okay on the chat or if you have any questions, just throw it out there and we'll take care of it in a few minutes. So three things about social entrepreneurship. The first one that I already partially mentioned is impact and legacy. It means to get things done, okay? So it's very important that we understand that success in life as human beings is the concatenation of a long series of small accomplishments, right? No one can do more in a day than what can be done in a day. So we have to make sure that we do everything we can in order to build up on those accomplishments. Not because success in itself is a goal, but because successful people with a mindful purpose are the ones that do great things and change the world. There's a, there's a, a, a famous proverb that says that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time is today. And yes, planting trees is just partially a solution to a global crisis that we're facing. But at the same time, this is an invitation for us to think what are the things we can do today in order to make a small contribution in that direction of what I could call civilizational success, which is the success where we are all belonging to. And finally, I would like to say that it's important once you find your purpose, then everything else is going to follow. It took me many years to find my purpose. And I don't know if you're all familiar with this concept of, um, sorry, Ikigai, uh, which means trying to find what you love doing, what the world needs, what you're good at, and what you can be paid for, right? So that little sweet spot, the green star, is your purpose. Uh, I told you it took me many years to find my purpose, but once I found it, I realized it was born 30 years ago as a Lincoln student. So it was in Lincoln where I gained this interest for environmentalism and bioliteracy that accompanies me still today. Okay, uh, moving on. I think it's very important as a social entrepreneur to count your blessings and to invest your talents. And in that sense, I would uh, issue an invitation to all of you to behave more like trees, to think more like trees, to understand that the biggest mechanism of wealth distribution in the world is creating and sharing opportunities for those that have less than you. So many forms of life live out of the tree, including the human being, that the tree can be thought of as this generous giant that is there just standing still for hundreds or thousands of years enriching its environment in multiple ways. So be more like trees. And at the same time, hone your learning skills. Number one, the factor of time I told you at the very beginning, the year 2050 is going to arrive inevitably. So let's make the best use of our time. Time is the most valuable resource that we humans have because it goes away whether we use it productively or not. So we might as well do. Second, the access to technology. And we're going to see further, further on 
the privileges that unite us all here, but it's very important to understand that if you are watching me speaking right now, you belong to a minority of human beings that have access to the internet, just to name one piece of technology. Second or third is languages. Uh, yes, Google Translate and many other applications allow you to understand and communicate across languages. And, and that is very useful, especially if, if you work in multiple uh, multicultural environments. But learning languages builds different neural connections in your brain. And those neural connections stay with you forever. So learning new languages and learning them properly is a very good learning skill for you to hone. Um, fourth is experiences. Expose yourself to multiple different things all the time. Move out of your comfort zones. Moving out of your comfort zones allows you to create new value. And either you voluntarily, intentionally move out of your comfort zone or an external force could move you out of it. And I guess the COVID pandemic is one of those examples where the entire global community has been pushed out of a comfort zone, okay? So this is a very good time in your life to intentionally pick up the habit of moving out of your comfort zones to create new value. Systems thinking, I think this is very important because I am speaking to a generation and I refer to those of you who are uh, high school students today, that I strongly believe is the first generation of human beings that understands consciously that every single thing you do today has a long-term holistic impact on the planet. If the hypothesis I am saying is true, then this gives me enormous hope, especially because I have children that are 10 years eight years younger than you guys, and I need you to be the best leaders you can be for my daughters. This leads me to the butterfly effect, and you've heard about the butterfly effect, right? That everything is interconnected. So a little flap of the wings of a butterfly in Japan is going to trigger a hurricane in the Caribbean. That's how the connections escalate and the feedback loops apply in systems thinking. And the planet is one single system. So this is the most important lesson. And if we want to think about the long term, one of the most beautiful examples I have found is this Native American expression that everything you do today has to be done with a mindset of doing it for your grandchildren and for their grandchildren's grandchildren. So you're thinking six generations down the road. If everything we did today had six generations in mind, we would have no big problems as a planet. And then finally, speaking about co-creation and the invitation I made to connect the dots, but also to share them here in the chat, if you feel like asking a question or sharing with us a concept that you find remarkable, interesting, innovative, that could help us build or co-create um, a set of uh, learning tools that we could use into the near future. And this brings me to the hummingbird effect, which the hummingbird effect talks about how the little hummingbird that is so popular here in Costa Rica co-evolved together with some of the flowers that protected themselves from other animals and predators. And that forced the hummingbird to evolve into a bird that was able to sustain itself on air, fly backwards, have a long beak to be able to, to pick up uh, the, the food that it needs that helps the flower pollinize other flowers, okay? So, so far, uh, any questions or any concerns or any interesting remarks, please share them with us on the chat. And finally, as a social entrepreneur, I know this might not sound necessarily intuitive, but I invite you to become billionaires. And the new billionaires today, the ones that make more impact, are the ones that solve problems for a billion people. Planet Earth has almost 8 billion people right now. But among these 8 billion, there are multiple problems that transcend countries and that affect communities as large as a billion. So if you are able to solve a problem for a billion people, you are going to have 
a strong impact as a social entrepreneur and uh, also in the whole community of humans around the world. So moving on to my next topic, uh, social justice. I think the idea here is that we try to, to operate from empathy through solidarity and to civilizational preservation. So from empathy essentially means the ability to tell someone else's story. Uh, I heard Katya at the introduction speak about storytelling. I am going to refer to storytelling a little bit down the road as well. But it is very important that we think about storytelling. If we are able to tell the other person's story, it means we are really able to create empathy. And in order to do that, we need to build trust. And trust is not unilateral. If I build trust with another person so I can tell their story, inevitably, that person has also built trust with me and hopefully will also be able to tell my story. So that's how I think we should build from empathy. Through solidarity, please pay attention to these numbers. They are rough estimates, okay? Around the world right now, there is a billion people that has no access to constant electricity. Two billion people without constant access to potable, drinkable water. Three billion people that have no access to three meals per day. And four billion people without constant internet access, okay? So this little, this little diagram here shows you how privileged we are of everything we enjoy right now. And therefore, the responsibility, core responsibility we have with other fellow human beings that uh, need a lot more of our help. And civilizational preservation, well, very clearly, if planet Earth is one single system, then it either thrives or it collapses. And it's no news for anyone here. It's been collapsing very quickly for the last couple of centuries. So that's why it is so important that we build the right kind of leadership that the planet needs in order to go back to thriving, okay? And that's what I refer to as regenerative development, which was the title of that first drawing I showed you. Okay, please feel free to share uh, comments and questions. Uh, let us know what you think, how you feel, what this means to you at this moment in your life. Uh, moving on to natural capital, this refers to the biosphere that was drawn in that green circle uh, around civilizations and around the global economy. And in particular, I would like to speak about bioliteracy, which I told you is what I discovered as a Lincoln School student 30 years ago, okay? And from there, I've built a purpose and I've built a career and I've built uh, a life of meaning for myself, at least. I feel that I am contributing in that way. And the question here, to make it simple, is, you know, where does wealth come from? Um, sometimes we don't realize that every single input for every single industrial process in the world has raw materials that come from nature. Uh, someone might, might say, well, there are some synthetic uh, materials or there are some algorithms that are autonomously built by other softwares or robots but still there is energy that likely comes from nature or other materials that build those robots that come from nature well I just mentioned energy food of course even if you're a poet I mean I'm, 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 I'm speaking uh, with admiration about poetry even if you're a poet you need to breathe fresh air you need to drink water, you need to eat. So all your raw materials for the creation of your art form comes from nature. Water and air that I just spoke about. Now, in terms of ecological footprint, we need to understand how big the problem is. And let me show you bigger how big the problem is. So this graph is about 10 years old, but it has actually gotten a little bit, more, a little bit worse in the last decade. Um, maybe the pandemic is giving it a little break, but that doesn't mean that we are starting to solve the problem. The problem is this. Right now, 
we are consuming more natural resources than, that the, pla than the planet can naturally replenish, which means that as of today, we are consuming about one and a half planet Earth's worth of natural resources. This means that we are eating the resources of future generations, okay? Of, of, of my daughters and probably of your children as well whenever, you, whenever they are born, right? So if we continue this path, this unsustainable path, by 2050, the year I told you for certain is going to arrive, we might need something like three planet Earth's worth of resources in order to supply our enormous demand, okay? This is unsustainable, clearly. We can't go that way. We need to shift and move rapidly towards a reduction in consumption so that we are able to fit within the natural limits of this one system on planet Earth by 2050. That's a task that many of you are going to face in your professional lives as, as uh, working adults, okay? And then this brings me to regeneration of the biosphere, which is the idea of that first model that I showed. Um, so wealth grows on trees. Essentially, the more trees, the more biodiversity, the more fertile soil, the more agricultural products, uh, the more raw materials, uh, the more technological progress, the more energy, and so forth. Uh, so we should move from a mindset of take, make, and waste to cradle-to-cradle -to -cradle systems. Probably many of you are already familiar with the circular economy where we try to imitate nature. That's what biomimicry is all about. So we imitate nature, and nature is a closed system, super efficient. There is no waste in nature. Everything becomes an input for some other biological process. Even sunlight that makes plants grow, and when they decay, they become soil. And over the millions of years, that soil is pressed down and it forms fossils. And those fossils generate this thick, viscous liquid that for the last 200 years or 150, we've been extracting from the earth and burning it with a consequence of piling up billions and billions of tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, polluting the very air we breathe, okay? So yeah, natural capital. This is where all wealth comes from. Moving on, and please feel free to, to uh, uh, share your thoughts and questions. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about after the fourth, industri after the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, uh, just, to, just to make clear, the first industrial revolution was the, the vapor engine, okay? 150 years ago uh, in England, they came up with a vapor engine and this brought a lot more productivity to human labor. Then the second industrial revolution was electricity. And this gave us an additional ability to produce and to increase the quality of our lives. But keep in mind, as I showed you before, that there's a billion people on earth right now that don't have it. There's a billion people on earth right now that have not yet enjoyed the benefits of the second industrial revolution. The third industrial revolution is computing. And all of you are looking at me through one form or other of computer, iPad or a smartphone or a computer, desktop, laptop, whatever. Uh, and I showed you also that more than half of humanity does not even have access to the internet, let alone hardware, okay? Um, and then the fourth industrial revolution is the period we've been living since, I would say around 1995, when we started developing the ability to monetize data, okay? I am sure many of you are going to study data science. That was not a profession that existed uh, anywhere near the time when I graduated from Lincoln School. But the fourth industrial revolution is not the end of the road. There is a fifth industrial revolution that has already started, and this is the 5G connectivity of telecommunications that is going to give us a lot more capabilities to move forward uh, in our uh, productivity and our ability to increase quality of life 
and solving problems for other people. Um, and I'll get to the sixth uh, uh, industrial revolution in just a minute. But for now, I just want to illustrate what disruptions mean from a technological point of view. In 2007, the smartphone came out. 2007 is not so long ago. I guess most of you were already born. Um, and the smartphone allowed for the creation of completely new industries like the sharing economy. And in the sharing economy, uh, companies like Uber were created because of the smartphone. So Uber means that today I can be transported as a service, not as the ownership of a vehicle, okay? And because I am using someone else's car and many people are using other people's cars, it means that less cars are sold, less cars are driven, uh, less oil, less gasoline is used, and this is causing a severe disruption in the oil industry. Who would have thought 13 years back that the smartphone was going to disrupt the oil industry? This is nothing that was planned. This is a complete disruption that no one saw coming. And then, more importantly, even before the pandemic, let's, let's go back six months in time. In January of 2020, there were already technological disruptions that were accelerating the pace of change in five foundational industries that have accompanied civilization for tens of thousands of years. In food, in energy, in materials, in information, and in transport. Okay, uh, many things are going to change. We are developing very fast the ability to manipulate proteins and to reach fermentation levels of proteins that allow us to create very healthy food without having to grow it in a farm the way we have done it for 10,000 years. This is gonna change in the next 10 years, okay? Energy as well. We haven't seen in Costa Rica the solar revolution yet because we've been so lucky to invest in renewable energy for 65 years. But as soon as the solar revolution hits our country, then most of us are going to become prosumers. It means that we're going to be producing what we consume in terms of electricity, okay? And this is a huge disruption because electricity basically is going to cost zero. Uh, then in terms of materials, 3D printing today is allowing us to bypass the entire international trade system. You know, you buy a pair of tennis shoes today and you read and they were made in Vietnam. They were manufactured there, shipped all the way here for you to buy them. But if you can print them in the, in the corner shop or even at home when 3D printers are uh, that inexpensive, then you don't need to wait for that uh, pair of shoes to come from abroad. You simply pay the shoe manufacturing company for the design in order to print them. Or even better, if you like, you can design them, design them yourself. Okay, this is a huge shift in materials. In terms of information, well, it's only, it's only uh, to our imagination what more we can do with 5G connectivity. It doesn't only mean we're going to be able to play faster games with better design. Uh, it means that a doctor sitting in a hospital in San Jose is going to be able to operate surgically on a patient that is sitting in a hospital in Limon using virtual reality, using robotic arms. Uh, this is going to be possible within the next 10 years. It is already possible. It's just not mainstream worldwide, but it will be in just a decade's time. And then transport. Well, think of Uber plus solar energy plus autonomous vehicles. So you're going to call a, a, a cab or, a, or an Uber and it's going to come pick you up without a driver and it's going to be fully electric with solar panels on the roof. So it doesn't even have to recharge anymore and probably it won't even charge you to use it. It's just going to tell you that in order to ride, you're going to have to share your data with it for as long as the ride lasts, and that's how you're going to pay. Exactly in the same way we pay today Google and Facebook for the services that they provide to us 
as, uh, as uh, technological platforms, okay? And let me show you this graph in a little big, bigger format. Uh, there are a bunch of names and a bunch of industries, but the point here is how these exponential curves that the iPhone experienced in, in the last 30 years is going to start happening with, uh, with quantum computing, it's going to happen with biotechnology, nanotechnology, robotics, um, telemedicine, crowdfunding, connectivity, you name it. Uh, and again, as I said, this is even before the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, some of these industries have just skyrocketed in the pace of change. So I had been keeping an eye on, on global e-commerce for the last number of years, five years or so, and e-commerce was changing, growing at 20% per year. This is enough to show an exponential increase. But as the pandemic hit in March and April, global e-commerce grew 113% in two months. It means it more than doubled in the first two months of the pandemic. And e-commerce is here to stay. Probably the same as some forms of telework, some forms of virtual learning, some forms of telemedicine. And, uh, and, and this is the reality we are living right now. Okay, uh, again, another invitation to share your thoughts and questions on our chat and we'll get back to them uh, very soon. And the last point I wanted to talk about is governance, uh, one of my favorite topics and one of the least favorites for, for many people. Uh, I guess sometimes we wish someone else would take care of that, right? But if we leave it up to others, eventually someone will come to take care of governance that you don't like or that you don't agree with. So, well, that's why I got involved in public sector 14 years ago because I thought it was better that I tried to do something instead of criticizing. And it was, it has been, a very fun experience so far. So the first thing that I want to say is directly related to storytelling. We need to build a fiction that we can all believe. We need to believe that tomorrow can be better than today. We need to believe that if we work in a particular direction, 2025 is going to be way better than 2020. And 2030, even better than 2025. But we don't have that narrative. We don't have that vision. And we need to build it. We are storytellers. For 200,000 years, since we developed our neocortex on our brains, we are able to imagine things that are not there, that don't exist, and pursue, persuade others to follow that vision even if it doesn't exist. And you can, you can read all the religions in the world, all the cosmology of indigenous groups around the world, they all have this in common, their ability to create stories and share them and pass them on generation by generation. And that has brought humanity to where we are today. But we are running short of stories and we need to create them. So this effort is up to all of us and uh, whatever stories you can come up with and share them and persuade others is going to help us co-create this future that we all want. I like speaking about the concept of prosperity. And for me, prosperity is uh, a collective attitude of optimism. So we all share the belief that tomorrow can be better. And therefore, we all work together to make it happen. Second, I want to make a distinction between management and leadership, speaking of governance, okay? Leadership is very difficult to define, but it's very easy to tell. You can tell a leader from a distance, even without talking to her. You can tell that she is performing acts of leadership, okay? To me, management is administrating value that already exists, and leadership is creating new value. Sometimes in life, you're going to have to do both. But if I have to choose, I will always prefer to try to create new value and then administrate it or have someone else administrate it for me or for us. Uh, so this is an important distinction when it comes to governance. And the last thing I wanted to mention is 
smart governance because technology is changing. Uh, when Katya was introducing me, uh, she was talking about uh, a, a tech company that I am working with called Cambiatus. Cambiatus has a blockchain based platform that allows communities to build social currencies. And right now we are building a social currency called Ticolones because we couldn't be more original. And Ticolones are going to help Costa Ricans have more access to essential goods in times of an economic crisis like the one we are living right now. So think of shifting from anarchy to decentralized autonomous organizations. This means, why do I speak about anarchy? And let me show you this picture in a, in a larger format, okay? So here you have human adaptability. Human adaptability is incremental. Little by little, we go adapting to whatever comes to us. And this means both technology, regulations, social relations, but technology grows exponentially. So eventually there is this gap of where we are today in terms of technology, we are very advanced. In terms of adaptability and governance, we are lagging behind and the lag is becoming bigger and bigger. So we need faster, smarter governance, the ability to bypass this gap so that we catch up or at least be able to adapt to the pace of change technology has. And blockchain allows you to build organizations that, has, that have a decentralized governance system. Could we think about applying this to a government? Absolutely. To a bank? Definitely. To the national registry here in Costa Rica, this is the example I like most. Every day today when you buy a car or you buy a house, you have to register it at the national registry in Costa Rica. But if you have a blockchain-based platform, then you don't need a centralized institution to prove who the owner is. You just transfer ownership and there is a transparent digital block that cannot be altered that shows who the new owner is. Okay, and there, go, there you go, you are bypassing a government institution by, by making it faster and smarter, okay? So we need to ask ourselves, which rules are being created? For whom and what for? Rules are living things. We can change them. They are not written in stone, okay? So it's very important that we start understanding this mindset shift towards rules that change faster and adapt better or help us adapt better to technological changes. And uh, well, I think this is more or less uh, the, the, the gist of what I wanted to share with you today in terms of bioleadership. And if I could just go back to the beginning and leave you with a thought in mind, is this model of regenerative development, this is what the world needs. This is probably the kind of leadership that you're going to face in your careers. Maybe some of you are already facing it in your lives and the importance of becoming uh, social entrepreneurs, regardless of what you do in life as a professional uh, or what, how you earn a living, trying to impact the collective is something that many of you are going to find meaningful to do in life. Okay. So, um, I guess now we can have some Q&A, is that it? Okay, I'm unmuted now, Alvaro. Um, we, we unfortunately have to, to bring the conference to an end because the, the students will continue with their, with their schedule. However, we cannot end this meeting without thanking you for the uh, valuable amount of information, experience, but above all, the values. I think that if there is something you have shared, with so much clarity today is your values and also you have invited us to think long term that every single action that we do today has an impact in the planet 
and also in providing in in trying to become billionaires i love the concept of being a billionaire affecting like creating opportunities for billions of people around the world that have less opportunities than we have you uh have uh, mentioned uh you have uh, invited us to connect these dots and have provided very clear examples. I think that we could just spend one whole conference talking only, for example, about disruption. We really hope that this is not the first time or the last time, I'm sorry, that we have you as a, as a guest speaker. We will be reaching out to you and uh, for everybody in our, in our audience, um, let's... Uh, Let's uh, stay in, in touch with, uh, with Alvaro, um, really, um, 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 and big thank you for the time uh, that you have dedicated to us today. My pleasure. Uh, I think we can save some of the questions that are here on the chat and we can answer them later, maybe make a little video with the answers and share them around as well. Um, and also hopefully we can capture the recording of the session so that we can share them, share it with those who were not able to join. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. And the students, you can, you can join your next classes um, and continue with the day schedule. <laughs>